right. Um, so for those of you watching at home, we're going over a little quiz we took. I'll post that quiz later today. Um, maybe we've gone over these first uh, couple problems talking about the area and the slopes and the y values of the relationship between G and F here. So we're looking at, um, at part C, it says, so find the values of X on the open interval from negative six to five, which is the whole interval of the graph, where G has a relative min. So where does G have a relative min? That would be where the derivative of G is zero or D and E, and what? Changes from negative to positive. And since the derivative of G is F, I'm looking for where F is zero, so where the y values of F are zero, and change from negative to positive. So go, going back and looking at that, I can see the y values are zero there, there, and there. There are no places where the y values don't exist. Corners have y values, right? So don't confuse slopes of F with values of F. I'm saying the values of F don't exist. That would be example. Example of that would be like a hole or vertical asymptote. All right. So that only happened here at negative four. So I had a min there, had a max at three, and I had a layout at zero. It appears. Right. And then, um, and the and the justification. If all you said was like the derivative of g is zero and didn't link that together, you didn't get that point. You got to link it together with f and g equal to zero d and e. And then if you don't say change from minus to positive you lost the other half. So those are like half of this, half of that, and one for the x value. Here on this, find the coordinates of each point of inflection. Where do the point of inflections on G occur? Where G double prime equals zero, but you, again, you have to link it. So G double prime, which is F prime, but not just zero, also D and E, right? So zero D and E, and this time it doesn't have to go minus to positive plus to minus, it just has to change sign. So where is the slope of F zero or D and E? Well, I got a slope at the top of the, the, top of the uh, semicircle, right? But I also have three slopes that don't occur at corner, 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 right? So you've got uh, or two corners. No, 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 three corners. There's three places where it doesn't occur at negative four, at zero, and at one. However, it only changes signs where? Where does the slope of F change signs? Not at this corner, because that the slope is positive, positive. Here it goes positive, negative, so negative two. Here it goes negative, positive, so zero. And here it goes positive, negative. I'm talking about the slopes of F, which are the second derivatives of G. So all three of those places, at negative two, zero, and one, and then you gotta make this statement. If you didn't say change signs, you lost the half that point. And then each of these would have probably been more, I would have probably made them that, that test question where they've been like a half a point apiece or something like that. All right. And then finally, um, on this particular one, if you didn't do your homework, this is probably something interesting, but maybe you pulled it out too. Um, if you did the homework problems last night, you saw this question. It said, let H be given by this function. Well, where would H be decreasing? Well, where is a function decreasing? When its derivative is negative, right? So what's the derivative of h? Not f of x, because when I ddx that, it's negative f of x, right? Because the x is on the bottom. So that means the eight derivative of h is the negative function. And I want to know when is that less than zero? Because when you're decreasing, the derivative is less than zero but the derivative is the negative function. So if the negative function is less than zero, what does that tell you about the positive function? It'd be greater than zero. So where's the function positive? Any place it's above the y-axis. Now, when I saw that, on, I went back and was looking through your homework, I was like, ooh, that's an interesting little question. But if you're not doing homework, this is the kind of thing that shows up on your test. I've said that before, most of y'all have experienced that. Um, these are the kind of things where you lose three points here or two points here or whatever. In this case, that would have been two for you. All right, one for making this statement. Either that or that was fine. And then one for finding. And by the way, it's positive there, right? But if it's decreasing, zero, decreasing, it's really decreasing on the whole thing, isn't it? So I, I, could, I could say that.
And then the last couple, it said, and we're going to get into this today again, even though I've mentioned it a bunch of times. Um, if you see this statement where the you have a derivative, I mean, the integral from 0 to 5 of velocity, the integral from 0 to 5 of velocity is what? The change in position, which is like the displacement. However, if I'm only moving in one direction because velocity is positive, then that change in position also is the what? Total distance traveled. So it has to be both of those. Okay? Now, if you don't know that about the velocity, if you don't know velocity is always positive, okay? You don't know that, then you'd have to go with just C. So one point for each of those. And then at the end, it just was asking you about just the general rules. First fundamental theorem, whenever you're integrating, you take the integral, which you, you would have gotten a point for that and writing 2, 5, or you would have got a point for integrating and plugging the 5 in and integrating and plugging the 2 in. That's typically how AP shows their grading scale. Although if it were me, I'm always going to show this and the work to make sure I'm going to maximize my chance at points. You end up simplifying it 96. Now the fundamental theorem, ddx of an integral, they cancel and so does the number. All you have to do is plug in the 5x times the derivative of 5x. So I gave you a point for plugging in the 5x and then a full point for remembering to go times 5 because that's really important to remember that and then a half a point for cleaning it up. Now that's that would have been 17 points on your test. Probably more than that, to be honest with you. But that's an example of a, and you're going to have a two-day test that each day is going to be worth 50-something points, and it's going to total up to be 100 and something. But I'm going to grade it out of 100, so you have a little bit of a cushion there. Yeah. So in the uh, in the, you want to simplify it down, and uh, yeah, I'll always want you to simplify it. Um, but I doubt I'm going to like. To me, that's not ugly. The ones we had on our homework yesterday were kind of. Ugly. I'm not going to make it where you're like, man, I'm square binomials and all this kind of junk. I'm not going to make it overly brutal on the algebra. I'm just not. And even if I did, it would be worth so little, you know, making a careless mistake on it. It's not going to be. Um, but I, I'm not going to say even if I did it. I'm not. I can't promise AP won't, but it doesn't. This feels more AP-like than some of the practice problems we do in my, in my experience. Not, that's not to say that every now and then I get a problem, I'm like, ooh, that's dirty. That doesn't feel like an AP question. They still show up like that every year, but not enough to change your grade significantly. What do we think? Not too bad? Okay, now you know your grade, okay? So if you're looking at 11 out of 17, you're not ready to take this test, okay? If you're looking at like 15 out of 17, that's pretty solid, okay? If you're 17 out of 17, you're in great shape. If you're like four out of 17, Lord help you, you need to go back and do some homework, okay? Because this kind of stuff needs to, and I'm not even throwing trick questions on you here. I mean, you could, I guess, call that one a trick question, but it's really not because it was on the homework last night, okay? So make sure, and by the way, if you looked at that key, you saw a really ugly way I did it, and then you saw a circle, and it was like, this is easier. And originally, I did it the real ugly way, and then later on, as I got to be better at calculus, I was like, why did I think that way? I mean, it was it was understanding accumulation, but it's so much easier just to do this. And um, anyway, so uh, let's talk about today. Anybody got any questions about anything wh where we are right now? Okay. All right. So today we're going to be looking, I'm on page 119, and we're going to be looking at what hopefully you feel like we've talked about a lot, and that's absolute value. Okay, now you may not realize it, but we, I have been mentioning it now for like three or four days, and I've been talking about velocity, right? Everybody with me? So what I've been doing is I've been saying things like, hey, when you integrate a velocity function, we end up getting some change in position, right? But when I integrate a speed function, let me just call it, I'll, I'll call it speed speed of t, we get a distance traveled, okay? And the reason why is because speed is the absolute value of velocity, all right? This is like a velocity curve, and, and velocity can be all positive. I've been doing a lot with positive velocity, 
But here's an example of a velocity curve that had positive values, negative values, positive values. And you could see if I was accumulating area, I'd be moving in the right, right? Moving to the right with a positive amount of, of a position change. And then I'd be moving back left with a negative amount of area, right? Position change. And then moving back to the right some more. So if I wanted, if I had a velocity curve and I said, hey, I want you to calculate the distance, then the easiest way to do that, if you have velocity, if I want to calculate distance with it, all I have to do is take the absolute value of it. And your calculator has an absolute value of it. Super easy. So if you have your calculator out, you want to look at this real quickly, in case you don't know where that is. Real quickly, if you have, and it's in a couple different places. Yes, one day will be calculated, one day, one day will be non-calculated. Yeah, good question. So if it's calculator day, and I say, hey, how far did you go, and I give you a velocity, child's play. Just make sure you put absolute value around it. Now, if you knew the velocity was positive, you don't have to, but it's a safe bet. Anytime you see distance, absolute value on whatever function you have, and that just assures that it's going to be positive and you're home free, okay? So like right here, if I wanted to do a integral here, I could say, all right, I'm gonna go to my calculus button or I could go to that little left side of the book and pull that open and say I'm going from like negative two to 10 and I could come in here and just go back to the book button and look right there, there's your absolute value. So you just click enter on it and you type your function in there and that just assures that all of your y values, remember when you plug a function in, those are, that is equal to y. So it makes all the y values positive. And if it throws all the y values positive, makes them positive, it's basically doing, it's doing this to your curve. It's taking all those y values, flipping them up. You might remember doing some of that at the very beginning of the year on our review. We talked about how you could take the absolute value of the function. Just flips them up. And now your areas are all positive. And that turns displacement into distance, distance, distance. Does that make sense? Okay, now, if you have an 84, just as easy. Seems like there's a couple places, kind of forget sometimes. So on the 84, you're gonna go math nine to pull up your inner. On an 84, you're gonna go math nine to pull up your integral say you do the same thing negative two to ten or whatever and you come over here and you can go to math I hit the math button which is below the alpha and then over one to number and the first thing you see is abs so you just hit one on that and it throws an absolute value symbol in there all right and another way you could do it is uh math nine you can go to your part right here and you can go to the catalog and if you know what the catalog is, it's at the bottom right over zero, and it lists every function. And since it's absolute value, it's the first one listed. So you could go second, zero, there's your absolute value also. So anything, any functions listed in the catalog if you have an 84. And by the way, if you're in the catalog, you'll notice it's already has the alpha mode to the little A right there, which means if you want to jump to anything that starts with a D, just go and hit the D button. It's our, the alpha's already hit, so all you gotta do is hit where the D button is. It jumps to D's, jumps to K's, jumps to L's, P's, whatever, jumps back to A's, but you can just pull up the absolute value that way also. So if you ever want distance, if you ever wanna end up with distance, you have to take the absolute value of that velocity, unless you know for certain the velocity is always positive, because in that case, it's not needed. Y'all seeing that? All right, so um, aside from that, what do you do when you don't have your calculator? Since half your test will be without a calculator. So I'm going to ask you a situation like that. I'm going to give you a velocity equation that's not going to be a really brutal looking one. And I'm going to give you an interval and I'm going to say, how far did you travel? And if all you do is integrate it, if all you do is integrate your velocity using your First fundamental theorem, that's only going to give you what? You're changing your position because it's going to be taking all these positive movements and all these negative movements and they're going to be cancel each other out and you're going to get a smaller value. So what do I have to do if I don't have a calculator? 
I could, but to graph it, what am I going to have to know? You need to find all the zeros. That's really all you need, isn't it? Because I really don't need to graph it. I just need to know where it crosses the x-axis. Because if I know where it crosses, that's where it's changing from plus to minus. So how do you find out where it crosses the x-axis? So you just set the function equal to zero and solve it, factor it, whatever it takes. Normally it factors pretty simply. I mean, we're not talking about ugly polynomials where you got to find the possible rational roots and synthetically divide. We're talking about stuff like x squared minus 4, 4x squared minus 8. I mean, these are, you know, x squared minus 2x. These are basic equations. But once you find those zeros, what if you still don't know what the graph looks like? Like, what if I give you a function, and, you, and granted, if you really stop and slow down and think, you'll, you'll know. But if you don't, and you just have zeros, hi, visualize this. I don't know what the graph looks like, but I'm trying to find the area from negative 5 to 7, and I set this thing equal to 0, and I find these two things. Right? Like, I, essentially this. I find these two roots. Now, how do I know... So I got negative 5, negative 2. Pretend you don't see the graph, 4 and 7. So if I'm trying to find the area of, say, this velocity function from negative 5 to 7, and I don't know what the graph looks like. I mean, the graph could be moving up and then down. It might even be bouncing off one of these and then going down. All things can happen, right? I mean, granted, if you really remember your pre-calc, you'll be able to troubleshoot some of these things because you know about double roots and stuff like that. And again, it doesn't get really brutal, you'll see. But how do I determine the area of all of this? What am I going to have to do? do separate, integrals. separate integrals. So I literally am going to go, all right, to do this, I'm going to have to integrate from negative 5 to negative 2, the velocity. I'm going to have to integrate from negative 2 to 4, the velocity. And I'm going to have to integrate from 4 to 7, the velocity. But that still gives me a slight problem. Again, pretend I don't know what the graph looks like. What, do I, what am I doing here? I'm integrating, but how do I know which ones are positive and which ones are negative? With the graph, I can look at it and go, oh, yeah, this part is going to end up giving me negative. So I could come in here and go, all right, that if that's going to give me a negative, when I find the area... I'm going to change the signs and make it positive. That's what I did here anyway, right? So if I can't flip it up, and all I have is the velocity function, but I know where it crosses, how do I determine? So think about it. Pretend I don't have anything, but I do have, say I actually have this function. Say I have the velocity, and this particular velocity function is... Uh, Let's just say it was uh, x squared minus 2x minus 8. Except I would have to have a t. So say this is a velocity function in terms of t and v. What could I do to determine whether this was positive area or negative area? There's an easy way and a hard way. Anybody? Do what? The first derivative test? Is that really what I need to know? You mean to like figure out where the like parabola is? I sure, certainly could do that. And I'm going to have to do it eventually. But to build, that's a great question, actually. I can definitely evaluate the integral. Like if I really did ask you to find the volume, you're going to have to integrate anyway, right? So integrate, 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 find the areas. If this one's positive, you go, awesome. If this one's negative, you go, not awesome, change the sign. And you could do that. But a lot of times, the question doesn't ask you to evaluate. It says set up the integral. Plug in something. Like, if I just pick a value right here, and I plug it in my function, and I get a positive value, doesn't that tell me that the graph was above the curve? So like right here, if I plugged in negative 3 in there, I get 9 plus 6 is 15 minus 8, 7. I'm above the curve. Positive. Awesome. 
If I plug something in between negative four, I mean negative two and four, like zero, plug in there, I get negative eight. Not awesome. Change it to a positive, right? And if I ch check something here between four and seven, it gives me positive again. So that's what I do. And the great thing about this is a lot of times, again, you don't have to evaluate it. You just have to write the expression. And now you have the expression and you walk away. And you didn't have to do an integral. Now, granted, the integral will be the same all three times. And it's not tough to do an integral like that. So, yes, you could always find the, the volume. But, again, AP finds ways to kind of see and maybe make you do things without uh, doing them in a normal, obvious way. So, again, check where the graph is by just finding a y value. Why did you negate the middle term again? Is that because when you integrate? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll show you the math. So, if I integrated that, I'd get what? t cubed over 3, 1 third t cubed, minus 2t two squared over 2, which is minus t squared, minus 8t, right? So I would be doing this from negative 2 to 4. And you can see the math involved in all this, right? So I would have to plug the 4 in, and I'm going to get some value. And I'm going to plug the negative 2, and I'm going to get some value. And when I subtracted them, I would get a negative area. But I don't want a negative area. So what would I have to do to make that positive so that it could be absolute value? negate the whole integral. But if all I want to do is write the expression, like Hope was saying, all you really have to do is see which ones were negative, which that one had a negative y value when you check the function, and just go, okay, well, if I know if it has a negative y value in that interval. Can it have a negative and a positive y value in the same interval? Why not? Because it would have to cross, right? And you already, if you have a negative and a positive, then it's got to cross in between with the one exception of maybe having a vertical asymptote or something like that. But uh, are you all tracking with me a little bit? Okay. All right. And by the way, we don't get into where you have intervals that have vertical asymptotes because the calculators are going to throw out, they say DNE. We, we, don't, we just don't get into that. So we don't have to worry about those situations. So essentially, that's what you're doing on this. Now, I don't have to do any of that. Again, if I say, what's the change in position? I give you velocity. Great. You just integrate like you always do. But whenever you get absolute value, you've got to find out where it crosses and integrate each part. All right? So it's going to require a little bit of algebra, a little bit of factoring, but not anything overwhelming. And, and the one the examples I just gave you here, you can see it right there, how to break up that. Uh, and a lot of times, that may be all I ask you about, you know? Just set up the interval. Now, these, I didn't give you really a whole lot of challenging stuff here. But if I did give you this, integrate from negative 2 to 7 the absolute value of x minus 3. So, again, what does the x minus 3 graph look like? Big old V. Or big old V at 3, right? Or what? So, you know what the graph looks like, which is great. But you could also graph x minus 3. So let's just say you didn't know how to graph that absolute value graph. Let's just say you didn't. I could graph this graph and say, okay, that, that graph crossed at positive 3. But I want to integrate this from negative 2 to 7. So you can see that if I ignored the absolute value, I would be taking all this negative area and all that positive area and adding them together, and it would be canceling a lot of itself out. But I know that the absolute value wants to make all of that function positive. And like Nolan said, if you know what the graph looks like, then great, go ahead and graph it, and you have the V function, right? But even if you know what it looks like, guys, even if you knew it looked like that, how do you do the integral? Are you still following me? You still have to integrate this x minus 3 function. You still have to integrate the x minus 3 function. But you got to figure out where it crosses so you can go negative 2 to 3, 3 to 7. And then you got to know where it's positive and where it's negative. Well, if you just pick a number between 3 and 7, like 5, and you plug it in there, what do you get? 5 minus 3 would be what? Positive 2y value? Well, I know that area is going to be positive, so I don't have to change anything. What about this? If I plug, a, say, a 0 in there, what do I get for a y value? Negative. Ooh, that, if it's negative y value, it's going to give me negative area. I better change that to a positive area. Yep. I'm confused about the 
Okay. I'm rewriting, I'm basically rewriting the absolute value function as of in terms of the piecewise function that it is. I don't know if you remember this, but like when you had a re really basic absolute value function, it was really sometimes it's positive function, sometimes it's the negative function, right? So some, and it's like that with anything. If I say absolute value of negative seven, sometimes you have to change the sign, right? But if I say what's the absolute value of positive seven, sometimes you don't do anything. So the definition of absolute value is two pieces of a function. One that goes positive, one that, like this is the x minus three, uh, sorry, x minus three graph. And this is the negative x plus three graph. There's two graphs. So I have to integrate each part. So I'm basically ignoring it and doing two integrals based on the first half until it hits the three and then the second half and then I'm making sure they both yield positive areas. Because if I, if, if I had the graph of it, now listen, if you have the graph right here, you really don't need calculus, do you? I mean, if I'm going from negative two to seven, and I know that's a three, couldn't I say base is five? I could figure out the height right there by plugging a negative two in. Height, I think, is end up, ends up being five. And I could say one half, times base times height, and I could find that area, right? I mean, I could do that. And then I could say here, base is four. Uh, if I plug a seven into my function, I get another four. So one half times base times height. <clears throat> I could find area accumulating, but I'm just trying to, I probably shouldn't have started with a really basic question like this. I probably should start with something that you don't know what it looks like. Because then you're forced to do what I'm telling you. So what I'm saying is if you don't know what it looks like, just ignore the absolute value and think about it as a line or a curve or anything. And then just realize I can't just integrate under there because I don't know if it's if it crosses or not. So what you would be doing is ignoring the absolute value, setting that function equal to zero and solving. That's the place where you get a zero. And that's in the middle of negative two and seven. So I'm going to break it up from negative two to three and from three to seven. I'm going to calculate those areas separately. And then I'm going to make sure they're both positive because that's what absolute value is asking me to do. I'll give you another one after this. Tell you what, why don't we just change the second one to this? You can scroll it out if you want. Let's go from, um, let me just think for a second. Let's go from negative one to six, the function absolute value of x squared minus 4x dx. So right now, do you know what x squared minus 4x looks like? Now you ought to at least know it's a parabola, right? And you also ought to know at least the parabola is going which direction? Oh, but if I ask you to right now just sketch it out real quickly, you're going to have to do a little bit more than just draw on your brain in an instant. You're going to have to think about, wait a minute, what does this parabola look like? Now, the easiest way I know to think about this parabola, I'm not going to try to find the vertex and all that junk. That's not necessary. I'm going to ignore the absolute value, and I'm going to think, whatever this curve looks like, let me make sure that it does or doesn't refine where it might cross the x-axis. Because if it crosses the x-axis, I'm going to get some negative area in there most likely. So I'm going to take whatever's on the inside, set it equal to zero, and I factor it. And it turns out x equals 0 and 4 as two locations, right? So, again, I don't have to draw the picture at all. All I have to know is that at 0 and at 4, it's crossing. And by the way, it's not bouncing at 0 and 4, or those would be what? Squared roots or double roots. And I, that, that would be a rare a kick thing uh, for an AP test. So right now, I know that on my interval from negative one to six, it's crossing at zero and crossing at four. But I don't know if it's doing up, down, or down, up. I do because A is positive, so I do know it's going up like that. But if you didn't know, 
okay? Or maybe if it was negative x squared, you weren't thinking, all I have to do is find the area on each of these intervals. So I can go, all right, from negative one to zero, x squared minus four x, from zero to four, x squared minus four x, I don't want to put that plus in there, from uh, four to six, x squared minus 4x, right? So those are my three areas that I'm going to need to find. But i got to make sure absolute value puts them all above, right? So how do I check that real quickly? So if I had plugged in something between negative, I'm oh, sorry, I don't know why that's a line, negative 1 to 0, 0 to 4, 4 to 6. If I check something in between, they're like negative a half. I get 1 fourth minus 2. That's negative. No, it's not. One. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I plug a negative one half. Yeah, so that would be positive, right? Well, then I don't need to change that sign. If I put something between 0 and 4 in this middle function, I get a negative. Ooh, i got to change that sign. Now, if you want to go ahead and find all the area, if it tells you to do that, then go ahead and do it. And then just change them later. But if all it did was say set up the expression, there's my expression, and I can walk away. I don't have to find intervals. Or Start catching up on some of this homework, guys. Do what? I said it looks almost like a first row of stuff. Well, it's similar. Yeah, I think that's what I'm thinking. I forgot that with first row of stuff, you need like an actual How do I feel about that? Yeah, Um, yes. It's three normal and then one of everything else. Well, like he helped for, uh, when I was learning about the right hand and he came from the floor, you know, that was left hand. Like, it's like 20 minutes. It's like percent yield. Yeah. Dude, it's so easy. It was first. It's so easy. I finished it like 20 minutes. I know. It's like, I'm not going to have a 98 hand class. What is it? There's two percent yields. There's one of those super long with the excess. And then like three easy ones and one of those where you draw yeah. a chemical plan. That's the easy yeah. so, easy. so the three easy ones are just normal like problems? <laughs> yeah, like, like normal. Like five grams? Yeah, it's like, 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 like easy, it just takes a while. Okay. 
the only one that's so y'all really are talking about a test? Be a little bit more discreet. That was $34. I know, but still. Come you know on, that that's it's not that. really ethical. Brilliant day. Um, that was some good stuff, man. First, we'll be contacting your teacher. <laughs> yeah. She literally told us everything yesterday. Yeah, she wouldn't care. She literally helped you on the quiz. Like she gave, uh, she said, like on the quiz, it's not a, uh, it's not something to determine your grade. It's a formative grade. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, Wait, what are these? What do you think? Buttons? Yeah, okay. Give me, give me a couple seconds. Oh yeah, I saw Walter. Oh yeah. It's for AP Psych. It's like it measures your stress. 